getting ahead of ourselves. All right, so I'm Brian Smith from Columbia University, and my co-authors are Xiaojun Bi and Xu Min Jai at Google, and this work was done while I was an intern at Google. So first, just to get started, for those of you less familiar, what is gesture typing? It's the notion of typing words on a touchscreen keyboard by connecting their letters with, sw with swipes, with strokes instead of taps. Unlike touch typing, you don't have to type spaces, so that saves you about one-sixth of all characters typed and uh, your finger travels less because you don't have to lift it between letters. So um, how does it usually work? It usually works in part by proportional shape matching. Let's, let's suppose that you want to type the gesture for the word wan, as in Korean wan, which looks like this, right? But the gesture you actually make looks like this. To find the similarity between the gesture you made and the ideal trace, the system will sample both gestures into n equidistant points and then compute the average distance between corresponding points. Hopefully, one is the word that comes up. Otherwise, you'll fall victim to perhaps the key disadvantage to gesture typing over touch typing, which is gesture ambiguity. Word gestures themselves are inherently ambiguous. And to show you exactly what I mean by that, it's time for a pop quiz. So I'm going to show you two different words, and your job is to tell me if those words have the same gesture, which is really bad, or if they have different gestures, okay? So we're gonna start easy. Of and off, two prepositions. Same, how many people think different? Who wants to be the, Andrew? So the answer, they're actually the same. Uh, they're identical. Next one gets a little tougher. Pretty and pray. Very stalkerish. How many people think that they're the same gesture? And what about different? A lot of people on the fence. Answer, they're actually the same as well. Third and last is singer and sinner. How many people think that they're the same? Okay, this one's tough. How many people think that they're different? All right, so the answer is that yes, they're actually different, even though they're very close, right? So clearly, gesture ambiguity is a big problem. But if you look at current systems and what they do to rectify the situation, they basically just leave the ambiguous word gestures intact. And they use what's called a language model to predict what you're typing after the fact by looking at the probabilities of the different word sequences you're about to form. But a language model isn't enough, and here's why. So it turns out there are three different types of word gesture ambiguity that we discovered. The first are un uh, unavoidably identical gestures, such as of and off, which we saw before. So these, just, these words were actually the same only because of that duplicate letter F. There's no way to proportional shape match that extra letter F. Maybe you can add some kind of wiggle detection, but not with, via proportional shape matching. So for about 4% of all words in English by dictionary count, and about 22% by usage frequency have another word with an identical gesture for this reason. Next category are avoidably identical gestures. These are words such as pretty and pray that we saw earlier. They're identical only because those T's that are in pretty happen to be located between the E and the Y on the keyboard. If it wasn't for that, they wouldn't be identical. So here are the statistics for this category. And the last and most significantly by far are similar gestures, which are also avoidable. So those are words such as singer and sinner that we saw before. Not completely identical, but nonetheless very similar. So within one key width of each other on average. A whopping 78% of all words by dictionary count and 69% of words by usage frequency fall into this category. Now these categories are mutually exclusive. So if you actually sum up the values in the right column here and subtract from 100%, you'll find that only 3.1% of words in English by usage frequency actually have a distinct gesture, which is pretty crazy. So then that raises the question, how can we make word gestures more distinct, right? The answer is to reposition, uh, change the positions of letters on the keyboard. That means we have to change the keyboard layout. But this raises a whole host of issues, first and foremost being learnability. 
right? So the upfront cost of learning a, uh, a keyboard layout is much greater than the eventual benefit that you'll get from using that new layout. Case in point, Xiaojun B found, um, and, and company found that if you freely optimize a layout for speed, you'll eventually be 24% faster at the upfront cost of being 100% slower. Second issue is that optimizing for speed, as existing uh, optimized layouts do, is a totally different animal than optimizing for gesture clarity. So QWERTY is actually, which is sort of the de facto status quo layout, is actually optimized for two-handed typing so that you frequently alternate hands when you're typing. But if you translate that to word gestures, that means the gestures are going back and forth across the keyboard, and they all look pretty similar to one another. Dvorak takes this a step further by placing common letters on the home row, but now gestures are basically horizontal line segments on the home row. And then uh, layouts such as Atomic and Square Optimized Stroke Keyboard, those were optimized for uh, touchscreen typing, but if you look at them, you'll see that uh, they basically cluster common letters together in the middle, and so word gestures are sort of clumped together all in the middle there. So this uh, dichotomy between speed and clarity raises a few key questions that we'd like to answer. First, must they necessarily conflict, or is there a way to find some sort of a harmony between the two? Next, how much clearer can gestures actually get? How far can we go when it comes to optimizing for clarity? And last, how will these answers change if we decide to keep the layout similar to QWERTY to foster learnability? So to answer those questions, we computationally explored the layout optimization space to, uh, related to gesture typing to uh, find out how three different metrics, gesture clarity, uh, gesture speed, and QWERTY similarity as a proxy for learnability, interact with each other. So first I'm going to cover the metrics, and then I'll talk about the optimization procedure. So the first metric, and most important by far, is the gesture clarity metric. This uh, the goal of the metric is to say how distinct the word gestures in a keyboard layout are. So it's based on proportional shape matching, which we saw earlier. Uh, it takes a keyboard layout as input, such as this, and then as output it finds the average distance between a word and its nearest neighbor on that keyboard layout. The nearest neighbor is the word that it's most likely to be confused with. So here I'm showing 10 gestures on the layout, just random words, but our lexicon actually has 40,000 gestures. Second metric is the gesture speed metric. This is based on the CLC model by Shane Cao and Xumin Jai, uh, which uh, models the time it takes to enter, uh, to gesture a polyline as the sum of a power function of the lengths of those line segments. So this metric takes a keyboard layout as input, and it outputs the expected gesture typing speed on that layout by finding the weighted average of these gesture entry times, and then converting that to words per minute. And finally, we have the QWERTY similarity metric, which is our uh, proxy for learnability. So this one is based on Manhattan distance. It takes a keyboard layout, K as input, and it treats, as if it, it treats it as if it's aligned on a grid, and then outputs the total displacement between keys on K and their positions on QWERTY. So uh, now I'll talk about how we actually performed the optimization. So rather than find one sort of gold standard keyboard layout that somehow is you know, awesome for all the three different metrics, we instead use a process called Pareto optimization, which takes a set of points. So think of these as keyboard layouts and their associated metric scores, and uh, computes what's called a Pareto optimal set. That's this set here, also called a Pareto frontier or a Pareto front for short, which represents layouts that are at the cusp of greatness, so to speak. So these layouts have the property that no other layout is, uh, is, or is that they're not dominated by any other layout. So meaning no other layout is better than these layouts in all of the metrics. So our optimization is in 3D, but here I'm showing 2D just for simplicity. So how do we actually discover all of these layouts? We used a heuristic search based on the Metropolis random walk algorithm. However, uh, we feel that you could probably use any type of search, including a gener uh, genetic algorithm to do the same, and it would work just fine. Uh, essentially, we start with a random keyboard layout. Again, I'm going to call it K, and we do the following iterative scheme. We swap two keys on K, so we're using the same footprint as QWERTY, uh, to get a new layout K prime. And if K prime is better than K, with respect to some heuristic, we keep it. Otherwise, we'll only keep it with some user-controlled temperature. 
uh, that, that gives us simulated annealings so that we can escape local extrema, local maxima, and go, uh, move on to global maxima. This heuristic function is just a linear combination of the metric scores with weights alpha, beta, and gamma. So we run the optimization a whole bunch of times with different values of these weights to explore that optimization space, albeit in 3D. <clears throat> so then once we have these layouts, then we compute the Pareto optimal set. So all in all, it took four machines with 32 threads apiece, three weeks to compute and uh, to, do, to perform the optimization. And here are the results. So this is the final Pareto front in 3D. It's convex, so lighter colors are farther from the origin in the back. Uh, and the axes here are normalized, so zero is min and one is max. So um, I should mention that none of the layouts on the Pareto front are inherently better than the others. Each is better than the rest in some way. And the process of choosing a layout from the front amounts to figuring out what your tastes are. So how important is learnability compared to speed or clarity for you? So if we take this front and we project it onto the ground here, the speed clarity plane, we actually get this. And this answers our first key question, which was must gesture clarity and typing speed necessarily conflict? The answer to that is while they definitely do conflict, this is a negative 45 degree line over here, um, not, you can nonetheless achieve big advances in both speed and clarity uh, compared to QWERTY. So now if we change, if we sort of unnormalize our axes and put them in terms of their actual units, so clarity, distance, and key widths, speed and words per minute, we get the answer to our second key question, which is how much clearer can the gestures actually get? How far can we go? If you do the math here, you can actually achieve about a 40% increase in clarity compared to QWERTY. So here's what some of the optimized layouts actually look like. The first is GKC, which is Gesture Keyboard Clarity. That's the one that's, that maximizes clarity, so it's right here. Uh, I call this the WAS layout for short. Um, you'll notice that it basically spaces apart common letters in a radial fashion outward. Next is GKS, which was optimized for speed. So that's the one on the other end of the spectrum right here. This one I call the What's Up layout. Um, and this one sort of clusters common letters towards the middle. Next is GKD, which is the double optimized layout, which is a sort of compromise between clarity and speed. So that one we chose by uh, finding the point nearest the 45 degree line here. And so, uh, so, you know, this one I call the Sith layout. And last is GKT, the triple optimized layout, which also incorporates learn, uh, QWERTY similarity. Uh, so that one we find by taking the layout that's closest to the 45 degree line in 3D space. So that's this layout here. This one actually answers our third key question, which was how will keeping the layout similar to QWERTY affect our results? Uh, the answer to that, if we place the layout on this 2D projection from before, you'll see that it's right here next to GKD. So that means that incorporating learnability, fostering it by including QWERTY similarity, actually uh, does not hurt speed or clarity very much at all. So now I'll give you, this is the final little piece, I'll give you a 30 second pitch about how uh, our uh, abstract metric scores uh, translate into real world performance measures. So regarding clarity and typing error rate, we found that uh, keyboards that incorporate gesture clarity in their optimization lead to lower error rates than those without. So the double and triple optimized layout, which included clarity, uh, have much lower error rates than QWERTY, for example. If you look at the double optimized layout on the bottom here, we actually reduce error rates by more than half. Uh, so, we actually, so users had to uh, gesture words seven times in succession, and so that's why you see seven things here on the horizontal axis. So now with regards to speed, we also found that incorp including speed as an optimization parameter uh, led to faster gestures as well, shorter and faster gestures. So the double optimized layout, for example, is 10% faster than QWERTY. And last, learnability. We actually found that incorporating learnability did not really help uh, people type faster at first. However, our study was limited because it was only held in a single session. Um, it's also possible that our QWERTY similarity metric, which used Manhattan distance, was too lenient. Maybe we should have used square distance, um, or maybe some other measure of what it means for a keyboard layout to be more learnable than some other layout. 
All right, last slide. So what have we done? We've uh, defined an optimization space for gesture typing, and we've computationally explored that space, answering several key questions in the process and discovering things such as, even though gesture clarity and gesture speed conflict with each other, you can nonetheless achieve big advances in both compared to QWERTY. Along the way, we've found some layouts such as uh, the double and triple optimized layouts that will make gesture, uh, that make gesture typing faster, more accurate, and more seamless than before. So thank you very much for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. So these are my co-authors, by the way. Okay. Question? Yeah. Hi, Tomer Moskovich, Amazon. Uh, really nice work. Um, so you posed the Pareto front as a, giving you the option to make a trade-off between things like uh, speed and clarity. But in real-world use, clarity actually translates to um, real metrics like speed or user frustration. Mm -hmm. So for example, if, because you have to make a lot of corrections, you lose speed. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas about how this, um, so it's not really a trade-off in, in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other metrics that you can optimize for uh, if we understood that relationship. Do you know anything? Yeah. Do you have any ideas about That's that? You raised two important points, right? So like one is that we actually did not take into account having to users having to go back and correct errors. Um, obviously, since so our optimization, we actually examined over 900,000 layouts. Uh, and so we had to do that with abstract uh, metrics. We couldn't user test all of them. Um, but what we did find, you can get some kind of results from our performance measures in our user study. Uh, the double optimized layout has a clarity increase of about 30% or so over QWERTY, and error rates were cut by more than half. So you can get some kind of a relationship there. Okay, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Michael Ross, University of Hannover. Um, so as I understood, you only tested for gesture input, but I think in practice many people occasionally use tapping input as well mm -hmm. on gesture keyboards. Mm -hmm. So do you have any idea how performance is affected for tapping-like uh, input? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we So um, that's a good question. So there are some other works that have optimized uh, keyboards with regards to trying to minimize uh, what's called tap interpretation clarity. Um, and their results are sort of similar to ours, but also kind of different because when you tap, you, um, you're not necessarily sampling all of the points in between. And so the optimizations actually did lead to, sort of to different results. I think if you were to try to, inc to also incorporate tapping, uh, in the optimization process, you'd find that words probably become a little bit closer together, or letters, uh, just at the expense of clarity by a little bit. But that's just a hunch. <laughs> yeah, and that's a good point because now we have by manual gestures as well. Yeah. Uh, Sanjun Kim from KAIS. Uh, changing a layout is always ris risky because people are very conservative to stick on a party. Mm -hmm. So advantages on your gesture keyboard will attract people to change their layout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's funny because I'm actually the type of person that uh, does not really want to adopt a new layout. But we feel that um, gesture typing alone has big advantages.